Look at the forecast, listen to the report, read the headlines, check the weather. We do our best to prepare for what is coming, but sometimes, sometimes the weather changes. The year was 1794, and the founding fathers were fighting after the American Revolution to protect what was a fragile, fragile democracy. Nostalgia might have you think that it was a nation brimming with opportunity from sea to shining sea, but history tells a little bit of a different story. J. Edwin Orr is a historian who wrote extensively on the past few centuries on the history of Christianity, of revivals, especially in the nation of the United States of America. And he says, in the wake of the American Revolution, the nation was a moral mess. Out of 5 million people that lived in the colonies, 300,000 were alcoholics. Women wouldn't dare go out at night. Banks were robbed on a daily basis. The pews were emptying out in churches, and the pastors were leaving the pulpit. Every single denomination was in rapid decline, and pastors picked up any job they could to try to put food on the table for their families. I quote from Chief Justice John Marshall, who wrote to James Madison at the time, the church is too far gone to ever be redeemed. While Thomas Paine echoed that, quote, Christianity would be forgotten in 30 years. Society was as perverse, immoral, and anti-Christian as you could get. But somebody saw a different forecast probably never heard of him. His name was Isaac Backus. He was a Baptist pastor from New England in Connecticut. And when he saw his nation and his city going down, he didn't think it was time to give up. He said, it's time to start looking up. So he gathered his church simply together to pray on a monthly basis on the first Monday of the month. There's a few pastors down the street that heard about it in their churches too. He said, well, well, we'll join you. We'll do twice a month on Tuesdays. A year later, they estimate two-thirds of all the churches in Connecticut were getting together on a regular basis with their congregation and praying for their city and praying for the United States. They were praying for the reigns of revival. A year later, I mean, it says the majority of all those churches were praying and it had spread to the rest of New England. Historians will tell you it was the sparks. It was the sparks that lit the fires of the Second Great Awakening, when entire cities were flipped upside down from their moral state. An entire society was transformed and turned back to the Lord as God drew a wayward people, almost in an instant, back to his heart. See, because God has always used the prayers of ordinary people to move with extraordinary power. See, I told you when we began this series 10 weeks ago that if you check the forecast for what's going on in the church, especially in our nation, it's not looking good. But today I come with a different word from the Lord. Our God changes the weather. Today I want to preach a message to close our series titled Prayers That Change the Weather. As we come to the 10th week, the final week, where we're wrapping up the book of James. And whoo, has it been a journey through the book of James. James may have beaten you up in this series. I hope I didn't beat you up. But it was only to build you up to have a faith that works that you're never going to have to quit and you're never going to have to leave behind. We've talked about what real, authentic, genuine faith is, how it's lived out and how that's practical and powerful in our lives. And James has just got one more thing to tell you before we close and finish the book of James today. He says, I want to give you something to spur you on so that you won't just walk with a powerful faith for a moment, but you will have a powerful faith that works throughout all the days of your life. Personally, powerfully, and world-changing power. So open up your Bibles to James chapter 5, verse 13. We're going to finish it today. And I think for this house, our prayer is simple this morning. 
So, Father, oh, Lord, teach us to pray. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 13, here's how James ends. He says, is anybody among you in trouble? Let him pray. Anybody happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, it's been said great theology is oftentimes found at the intersection of clarity and complexity. And when you open up the book of James, these verses are perhaps the most clear and complex as they come. I mean, on the one hand, there is clarity that he says, let's pray. Let's just simply pray. Prayer is a place of power for the believer in Jesus. There's clarity. And then there's a little bit of complexity in these verses. I mean, theologians would say, a lot of them, these might be the most complex verses in the entire New Testament. Because you may have questions like I have before, like, how do we pray? And who should we be praying? And what's up with the magic oil? And what's up with the prayer of faith? And how much faith do you need? And does it say that God doesn't heal if I have unconfessed sin in my life? Is that what these verses are, are saying? So I want to get to the powerful. I want to get to the practical. I want to get to the prophetic. But I think definitely in this house, perhaps in your faith, if you're new to following Jesus, maybe we should start with some presumptions about prayer, shall we? Maybe I should sort out a few things. What is this teaching? What isn't this teaching? And what does prayer mean in the life of the everyday, ordinary believer? I want to give a headline today, the presumptions about prayer. Because here's the big idea that we're going to unpack is faith that works praise. Can somebody say that in the house this morning? Faith that works praise. I mean, an active prayer life is essential for a faith that works. I mean, it's also clearly essential for a church that works. Notice how James is like reminding all the churches of this. Remember, this was a letter sent out to the churches. He's like, hey, you know about that praying thing? You should do that. That's my final remark. You should do the praying thing that should be active within your faith and active within your church. I mean, look what he says. Anybody in trouble? The whole early church is like, yeah, we're all in trouble. We're all being persecuted. We're being, like, hunted. He says, pray. He says, anybody happy? I don't know. Some of the hands might have gone up. They're like, yeah, we're, we're happy. So pray. Praise. That's what worship is. It's praying along with music and singing. Pray. I mean, he just says, anything going on? Anybody sick? Pray. You should pray. I mean, prayer is a place of power for the everyday, ordinary, spirit-filled follower of Jesus. I mean, we're not shy about this at Miracle City. Any situation, any diagnosis, any joy, any pain, any tear, any sorrow, we go to prayer. It's our first response. We don't bring God a bunch of solutions. We go to the God of all solutions, and we say, you know, we can pray about this. We can get answers from the God who gives answers and who moves through prayer. I mean, James is also saying, look, everything I've taught you in my letter, you know, all the other weeks of this series, from your trials and temptations, to your words and your relationships, to your plans, to your waiting, it only works through prayer, you know. You got to keep praying through all of that stuff. Because prayer is not an event. Prayer is not an activity. Prayer is not just a department at the church or something that your pastor does. Prayer is how your faith works. Remember, faith that works is what? It's a relationship with Jesus. Prayer is simply talking with God. Prayer is interacting with the one who split heaven and earth to come and interact and be in a relationship with you. I mean, if you've never known it before, maybe just personal prayer is is really powerful. It's part of the everyday life of the believer. I mean, why you need prayer? To be in a relationship. I mean, think about the friendships that you have. Think about the family that you have. A healthy, thriving relationship includes dialogue. It includes talking. It's one of the primary reasons we pray as followers of Jesus because it's a time of intimacy with the Lord. 
You can share what you're going through. You can reveal what you're feeling. Yeah, God already knows, but he wants to hear it from you. I mean, prayer is primarily not a way to get what you want. Prayer is about being with who we need. It's a relationship with Jesus. Prayer is how we get an intimate relationship with Jesus. And then you come to find out prayer is also connecting with God's heart for the world. I mean, sometimes you may be caught in the complexity of like, why should I pray if God already knows everything and he's sovereign? He is sovereign. But God has sovereignly chosen that his plan is to use the prayers of his people. That's why we pray, that God might invite you into some things and say, hey, I want you to pray along for this. I'm drawing your heart into this. Like we say at Miracle City, we pray like it depends on God. We work like it depends on us. Prayer is also connecting with God's heart for our situation and our needs because God does want to meet your needs. He does want us to intercede for your life and for one another. I mean, prayer is ultimately how you communicate with the one who has and knows what you need. I think perhaps Martin Luther said it clearest. He said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. I mean, even if this is your first weekend, or if you've forgotten everything else in the series, which I pray you didn't, but if you did, it's like James saved the best thing for last. He's like, you have a relationship with Jesus, so pray. It's how your faith breathes. You can share everything with Jesus. I know so, sometimes you may think like prayer is when I close my eyes and I bow my head and I sit there for 30 minutes and I try to focus on God. You can definitely do that. There's a time and a place for that. But can I just expand your thinking? Prayer is just conversation. Prayer is always connecting with God wherever you're at and wherever and whatever you're going through in life. I mean, it, it could be your tears that you're connected with God about, your sighs, your hopes and your dreams, your worries and your anxieties. God just wants you to bring it all to him in prayer. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to talk with you. As James is saying, hey, it all works. It all breathes by prayer. Do you have that kind of a conversation with God? Did you know God is that loving that he just wants that kind of conversation with you as well? It doesn't matter if you've got stuff tangled up in your life. You just go to God. He wants to be with you right where you are at. I mean, there's power in personal prayer, isn't there? Anybody got that testimony? Say, my faith is, it lives, it breathes by prayer. And then James says, I know, and it gets better than that. There's also a corporate side of our prayer, too, because he keeps saying, well, pray for one another. Here's what he says in verse 14, 15. He says, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. And anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Now myself, along with many other theologians, would say that this is James being more descriptive than prescriptive. James is more describing generally how prayer can work and less giving you a specific formula for how prayer has to work. And these are the verses that get really complex and come with a lot of questions and a lot of theologies and a lot of, yeah, but pastor, I heard this and I heard this. So maybe can I just bring some help to this this morning, maybe a bit of unity to Miracle City and maybe a bit of help if maybe you've kind of been confused by healing prayer and who does it and how does it work and why do we have oil and what's up with the amount of faith that you need? I think maybe the first place we should start is, well, let's talk about the prayer of faith. How much faith do you really need? Because maybe you have heard it taught or someone told you that maybe you didn't get healed when somebody prayed for you or you prayed because you just didn't have enough faith. And if you had a little bit more faith, then you'd be healed. Look at me. That is not what the Bible teaches, and that is not what James is talking about here. That's not true. And even worse than that, if you're sick and praying for healing— then you're sick and you're doubting your faith because you think you didn't have enough. And then you actually start thinking that you are responsible for the answer to prayer. When the truth is that God is responsible for the answers to prayer. We pray to Jesus because Jesus is the healer. Uh, in Mark chapter 9, let me give you an example if you're like, where is this in the Bible? Jesus interacts with uh, this dad. His dad's got this son who's impossibly 
sick and the dad runs up to Jesus because he's heard Jesus heals people physically and says, hey, can you heal my son? And Jesus says, do you have faith? Do you believe? And this guy, I just love his answer because it's so relatable. He says, kind of. <laughs> but Jesus, help me with my unbelief. And then Jesus heals his son. Why? Because that's faith. Faith is not about the amount. It is about the object that you put your faith into. And here's all James is saying. He's saying, pray with simple faith. Pray with simple faith. How much faith do you need? Just enough to trust in Jesus. Just enough to put your faith in Jesus because he is the one who is strong. He is the one who is mighty. He's the one who answers prayers. He's the one that does all of the healing. We just get to bring ourselves to Jesus in prayer. Can I just say faith that works simply prays with even the littlest bit of faith. But you may say, well, does this mean that God always heals? Because it kind of seems like that's what it's saying. It says, will be healed. The prayer of faith will be healed. So maybe that's why I wasn't healed. You know, God gives answers to prayer, doesn't he? And sometimes God answers yes, immediately. I love those prayers. Can I get an amen when God says yes, yes, immediately? I'm like, woohoo, that's great. Seems like they don't always happen that way, though. Sometimes God says no, immediately. Sometimes God says yes, but it takes a long period of time. Sometimes God says no, but it takes a long time in us to reconcile and come to accept that God has said no. I mean, God holds the answers to prayer. And some take verse 15, we'll just kind of get into the details, to mean that God always heals. It's always God's will to, to heal. Now here's a bit of my theology. I it's hard for me to read through the Bible and get there. That sounds really good. It really does. I, wa I want that. But then I read through the pages of Scripture where we find truth in God's Word. And I'm like, yeah, but that just doesn't seem to be the way that God always, always works. I mean, the Apostle Paul, you talk about a guy with a lot of faith who prayed out to God and said, please heal this thorn in my side. And Jesus said, I won't because my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. I'm not going to heal that, Paul, because I'm ultimately in control. See, prayer, I don't believe, is this way to control and command God. It's a way to commune with a God who is in control. And there's a big difference there. Because when we think we're in control, then we become God, and then the answers to prayer become all about us. But Jesus said, you just trust me. I'm the one who answers prayer. You can simply surrender it all over in to me. You know, it's, it's interesting. In verse 15, it says, the prayer offered in faith will save the sick person. That's literally what it says if you dig into the Greek. It's, it's kind of a strange verse. It says, the prayer offered in faith will save the sick person. Which is a weird w way to talk about it, because don't sick people get healed, not saved? I mean, when the Bible talks about saved, it's always God saves sinners, and he heals the sick. Except Jesus talked about it a little bit different. And I think this is what James is doing. He's taking one out of Jesus' book. When Jesus would come and minister, he'd often catch people's attention. Like when the paralytic was being lowered from the roof, they cut a hole in this person's roof, lowered this person on a mat in front of Jesus. Can you imagine the scene? And everyone was expecting Jesus to say, wow, that's a lot of faith. Your faith has made you well. But Jesus says, aha, I have forgiven you of your sins. And people are like, say what? This guy is saying he has the power to forgive sins, and, he's, and then he heals them. Because Jesus came primarily to heal the sin sickness of our heart on the first time around. He's coming back. And when he comes back, he is going to have everything new, everything restored, everything healed. You have healing in Jesus' name for eternity. But James is using this little word very creatively, I think, to point us towards the cross. He said, trust God with the answer. Trust God with the answer. Because the eternal answer is already yours immediately in Jesus Christ at the cross. And whether God says yes now or he's already said yes into eternity, we can simply pray and trust God with the outcome. Because we believe God heals. But he calls us into the process. 
not to decide the outcome. You may say, well, is it certain people? Like, do I have to be an elder to pray for healing? Maybe you were taught that at your church. Or someone was like, whoa, that's advanced prayer stuff. Like, you cannot get into that. That includes oil. Like, what's up with the oil? You know, James is saying, call the elders to pray. More in this context of saying, like, you're bedridden, you're at home, you're sick. Call people from the church over to pray over you. And then, like, the next verse, he says, pray for one another. James is not being exclusive in who can pray and how they can pray. James is actually being radically inclusive, saying, come on, let's all pray. And as a church at Miracle City, we practice all of the above. We have our elders go and anoint and pray over people. Yeah, and we also have our pastors and our staff do it. Yep, and we also equip our home group leaders on how to pray. And maybe your servant leader team has, has prayed for you before, or somebody random at church or you don't even know, and they are praying for you. We say yes. That is who we want to be. And maybe you're here, and this is like, that is a radical concept. That is not the kind of background I come from. Can I just take maybe a minute and say, I, I hereby commission you in the name of Jesus to pray for one another. That is an okay thing to do. You can pray for healing in Jesus' name for one another. You don't got to go to one specific person to do it. Let's just pray is what James is saying. I mean, Romans 8, 11, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives inside every single believer. That's what the oil is primarily about as well. I even brought some of it with today. This says anointing prayer oil. It's just regular oil. It just comes with a really fancy label. The oil was more of a symbol of the Holy Spirit than anything else. This is what they did in the Old Testament. They would anoint leaders. They'd anoint priests or prophets or anybody they wanted just to set apart for a spiritual purpose. It's about focusing in. It's about setting apart. That's what anointing means. It simply says to set somebody apart in that sense. There's power to it. It's not like some magic oil. You don't got to buy this for three easy payments of $24.99. The theor theological word for that is scam artist. Don't <laughs> do that. Just come straight to the word of God. I'll tell you, though, when you do it, I have always left more edified and encouraged when I do because there is such focus. There is such invitation. There is such faith and expectancy in the room when we anoint and when we pray for somebody. God just encourages. He fills up. He moves. The Holy Spirit, he stirs. And let me also say that the oil was also James's way of saying medicine in his day. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan where the, the Good Samaritan comes along, the guy who's beaten up on the side of the road, and he pours on wine and oil onto him because oil has medicinal properties as well. It's James saying, hey, don't forsake the miracle of modern medicine in your society either. We've got gifted nurses and physicians and therapists and counselors in our society and part of Miracle City Church, and you are part of the miracle. I mean, if you've ever heard someone say, like, you just got to stop taking your medicine to really get a miracle, no, no, false, false, false. God uses natural means and God uses supernatural means however he wants to. I mean, if you've ever been on a healing journey with someone or in your own life, you know it's a journey, isn't it? I mean, I don't know how it exactly works in God, but I find he uses the natural means mixed in with a little bit of supernatural means, sometimes more of one or the other. But it's a journey because God is so unique to every story. God is so unique to every healing journey that someone is on, and he simply says, hey, I just want you to pray for it. I want you to realize that there's a spiritual connotation to this. And there's some natural connotations to this as well. Can I just say Faith Network's praise? It's pretty simple. We can pray for healing. We can pray for one another. Maybe you said, this, but, but what about the sickness, like, for unconfessed sin? Because, like, I had someone tell me once that, like, maybe I wasn't healed because there's something unconfessed in my heart. I mean, maybe you read this verse in 15, 16. It says, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Can I tell you what James is saying here? He's saying, check your heart. Check your heart. 
not all sickness comes from unconfessed sin. But some can. What James is talking about here is if you have ulcers because you are so angry and you have bitterness and rage inside of you, there is a clear spiritual issue that might heal the physical issue. If you can't sleep and all the problems that come with not being able to get rest because you are harboring unforgiveness in your heart, you have a grudge against somebody, James is saying there might be a spiritual issue that can clear up a physical issue. Isn't it true that sometimes you don't need divine intercession, you just need direct intervention? That's what James is saying. He's saying, go to my half-brother Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, because at the cross he paid for it all, and you can get all your sins forgiven, you can clear up all of that spiritual stuff, and it may manifest to clean up a lot of physical issues as well. You may say, but how do I know? Like, maybe there's some unconfessed sin. Maybe I got to, like, comb over my entire life, and I got to find the sin, and then I find the sin, and then I get rid of it. Stop. Psalm 1912. David. You talk about a guy with sin and unconfessed sin. You can read his whole testimony in the Bible. David even prays to God and says, oh, my goodness, God, forgive me of my unconfessed sin. I'm sure there are things going on in my life that I haven't gotten right. Your pastor would say the same thing. Anybody got that testimony where, like, you've been doing something for a year, and then the Holy Spirit convicts you, and you're like, oh, my goodness, I've been doing this for a whole year. I thought I was, like, doing the right thing, but then it was wrong. That's why you don't got to comb over your whole life. There's grace, grace. You can go to God and pray about it because God's got the answer. You don't got to worry about this being this hidden thing, and it'll be clear to you if it happens. I'm contending for this. To cut through so much of what is complex within the church to get to the heart of clarity that the word of God is saying that there is power in a praying church. There is power when everyday believers lay hold of prayer. And so often we love formulas and explanations, but God works on faith and expectation. That's why James is saying, come on, church. Let's just pray. Every season, every situation, no matter what's going on, faith that works praise. Come on, can you tell your neighbor this morning, faith that works praise. I believe some people in this house are starting to believe it this morning. I want to talk about the power of prayer. Because if we can get past all the presumptions and maybe clear it up to say, well, God is inviting all of us to be part of how he created us, there is power in prayer. Because I believe God still heals those who are under the weather. And I still believe God changes the weather that the world is under. It says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Verse 17 says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. Come on, someone say, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. The year was 860 B.C., and God used an ordinary man, just as we are, to change the trajectory of the weather in his generation, just because he had the faith to say what God says and pray what God prays. In a world that was walking away from God. King Ahab, Queen Jezebel were in charge. And they were leading the nation of Israel off in the opposite direction. It was open rebellion against God. And God told Elijah, pray what I ask you to pray. Deuteronomy 11, God was clear with his people. If you walk away from me, I will not send rain. I will send a drought over the land to show you the drought that is in your hearts until you turn back to me. And so Elijah prayed, and for three and a half years, it did not rain. And it caught the attention of the people. It caught the attention of the king and the queen. And Elijah said, we'll figure out whose God has the power to change the weather in this generation. So meet me up on Mount Carmel. The entire nation gathered together with Elijah. All the prophets of the false idol Baal were there. They set up two altars, put a sacrifice on top, and said, we'll pray. See who can consume the sacrifice and change the weather. 
all the prophets of Baal, they sacrificed, they cut themselves, they danced, they shouted, nothing. That's all idols do. They make you cut and bleed and sacrifice for them, but they will never respond. There is no power. And Elijah steps up, gets down on his knees, and he offers a simple prayer of faith. And fire falls from heaven, consumes the sacrifice, the water he poured on top of it. And everybody knew that day whose God had power because an ordinary man had the faith to pray. And Elijah left the sacrifice, walked by King Ahab, and said, I hear the roar of rain coming on a clear blue sky. Went up to the top of the mountain, started praying, asking for rain but asking for the rains of revival to fall on his land, to win back hearts and lives. He prayed once and asked his servant, go go check the sea, see if you see any clouds. Servant came back, there's nothing. Elijah knew that sometimes God says yes, but it might take a little time. So Elijah prayed again, twice, had him go check, nothing. Clear blue sky. Three times, four times, five times, six times. You ever prayed for something and had to, keep prevailing in prayer, still nothing. But on the seventh time, Elijah prayed, and his servant comes back and says, Elijah, I see it. There's a small cloud in the distance, and it is dark with rain. And Elijah said, that's it. And he took off down the mountain. He ran through the valley, and the rain fell upon the land, drenched it, soaked it, because our God changes the weather when ordinary people pray. He caught the attention of the ear of God who wanted to move in his generation. You may be thinking that's a great story about a mighty hero of God, but I'll never be like Elijah. And you will miss the book of James who is telling you in these last verses that is exactly the kind of power that is available to the ordinary everyday believer. That's why he's saying Elijah was an ordinary man. He was just like us. And he did the simplest thing of praying by faith, being stirred by God in his heart. Every hero from the Bible is just an ordinary man or woman who turned their heart up to God and believed for God to move in their generation. Their faith was working, their pulse was beating. You know, you can tell the pulse of your faith by your prayer life. Is it working? Are you believing? Do you have prayers that you're praying over your family, over our city, in your generation, in your company, for your family members who are lost, for your friends who don't know Jesus, where the rains of revival need to fall? I believe God can change a generation. And I believe he does it through prayer. I want to talk about prevailing prayer. That's what I want to talk about because this is where James is landing. And I hope you can see it's where he's landing the entire series. Because faith that works prays and faith to keep working, it's only sustained by prayer. Faith that works is sustained by prayer. It prevails. Because for all the forecast says in our nation, in our city, in our neighborhood, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look like it's headed in the right direction. But we pray to a God who sends rain. We pray to a God who on a blue sky day sends a storm to refresh and revive an entire world. And I'm not preaching this message just from these scriptures you may notice. I I got a little bit of a testimony that's given behind this one. In in 2015, I I read a book that just lit my prayer life on fire. It was a book by uh, pastor and author Mark Batterson called The Circle Maker. And the stuff he talked about has always stuck with me because prayer is so powerful. It's the same stuff James is talking about. Same stuff by faith Elijah walked in and his three ideas he writes about in that book. I began to practice, and I began to see movement and miracles happen all throughout my life and in this city. He says you got to dream big if you want to prevail in prayer. 
you got to dream big. And, and I remember that year, God gave me a dream for our city. And it wasn't a dream that I had come up with. It was a dream that I simply opened my hands up to the Lord and said, what are your dreams for my generation? What do you say about this city? What's the name that you have for Minneapolis? Our God's in the business of changing names. How do you see this neighborhood? How do you see this city? Might I be a part of it? I think sometimes we think the dreams and the visions that we have, which are great, but we can caught up in a prayer life that just asks for God to bless our dreams, but the big God-sized dreams are his dreams that he simply invites you up to come and see. I began to see a big God. I began to see a God who had bigger plans than I could ask, think, or imagine. I mean, if God says in Psalm 2.8, ask me and I will give you the nations, why aren't we asking him for a city? What dream do you have? What dream in God's heart, are you pursuing? I mean, I got, I got big dreams right now. I'm praying for the weather to change in our city, in our state, in our nation. Has God shared a dream with you? Maybe your prayer time this week can simply be, in God, I want to know your heart. I'm going to stop doing the talking in my prayer life right now, and I just want to know your dream. I want to know the good plans that you have for my life. And I want to step into the fullness of those plans. Maybe it's for healing in your family. Maybe it's for a, a, a friend or a spouse or a kid to get saved or return back to the Lord. The thing about God's dreams is they're not just hard. They're impossible. So we go to the God of the impossible to pray and to get his dreams because all things are possible for those who believe in Jesus. We got to dream big. And then you got to pray bold. Mark Batterson always says, prayer is how you write history before it happens. It's not about us coming up with our own will. It's coming into alignment with the will of God in our generation. And the will of God is to save, to sanctify, to set free, to deliver, to heal, to take narratives and cities and nations and flip them upside down when people see a city like Minneapolis and say, how could anything good come out of there? Our God says, miracle city, because I can do all things. And it starts with praying boldly for that in our lives. So I started walking around. Started getting off the bus a little bit earlier. I worked up on 6th and Nicolette. Got off, interestingly enough, and walked down to 15th and Nicolette. I stirred my heart around Loring Park, and I just began to pray bold prayers. Jesus, could you so encounter a people that they would be changed forever? I mean, I wasn't a pastor at the time. I didn't have any plans. I didn't have any people. I didn't have any money. I just had a big God who me and my wife just started believing in and praying boldly for. I mean, I don't know how it works in God's economy. I try to stay out of that stuff. But maybe I could just share a testimony that somehow, on the same blocks that we prayed, what, nine years, ten years ago now, through the same neighborhood, we now have a church at a theater that we own in a neighborhood that is being transformed by the power of God to the glory of Jesus. I mean, long story short, in a thousand miracles along the way, God moves through bold prayers. I just wonder if we're praying them. What are you praying about boldly right now? I mean, I got a lot in my personal life. I'm praying boldly over my son that he would give his life to Jesus and stand for the Lord and his generation. I mean, maybe you're, you're praying boldly for something in your career. Maybe you're praying boldly for God to give you and to share a dream with you like we just talked about. You're boldly praying for someone to come to faith. You're boldly praying for physical or emotional or mental healing. I, can I just say God is moved by the boldness of our prayers. Because the boldness of your prayers demonstrates how big you think God is. You just try to blow God's mind with how bold your prayers can be. And he can always do exceedingly more than we ask, think, or imagine. Anybody got a testimony? You got to dream big, you got to pray bold, and you got to think long. We tend to overestimate 
what we can accomplish in a year. And we tend to underestimate what God can do with a lifetime. We tend to get them all mixed up. We like the instant. We like the, we like the right now. But God says you got to think long if you're following my son, Jesus. I mean, think of Elijah. Elijah didn't see any results to his prayers. If there is one person who should have gotten their prayers answered, like right then, putting his neck on the line for the Lord in front of the prophets of Baal, shouldn't it have been Elijah? <laughs> like, if there's one person. But God was teaching something more profound in the heart of how God works through the faithful prayers of an ordinary person like Elijah who just wouldn't quit. He just wouldn't give up. He's inviting you to into it too. Because the truth is when we, when we don't, we just don't just pray to God. We pray through. It's the old Christian saying, we pray through. Prayers are like seeds that we sow. But prayers are like seeds that you sow and they, they oftentimes got to grow. George Mueller, you ever heard of him? 19th century prayer warrior recorded over 50,000 answered prayers in his lifetime. Can you imagine? He said 5,000 of them were answered on the day he prayed them, which means that 90% of them weren't. 90% of his prayers were not answered on the day he prayed them. It took patience. Oh, yeah, remember the patience of the farmer? who sows seed, who patiently and actively waits for that seed to grow. Some prayers are beyond generations. Some prayers are for kids or grandkids or generations you may not even meet, but you'll meet on the other side of of eternity. Some prayers we just press into for decades. I mean, a long view of prayer sustains a lifelong walk with Jesus. You got to think long. And can I just say, if you've ever prayed for this church, if you've ever prayed for this neighborhood or this city, your prayers are working. Your prayers are growing. Every salvation, anytime someone gets baptized, anytime someone shows up to church and hears the gospel, anytime that someone takes a step towards Jesus, that's a direct answer to the prayers of God's faithful people believing that God can move in our generation and that God changes the weather. If you want to get involved in prayer, can I just say come to City Nights? God's doing something at City Nights this summer. He's stirring up something in the heart of this church as we intercede for our city and and the nation and for our our church. If you felt more encouraged in your your faith or maybe more consistent in your faith, hey, I don't know how it works. That might have something to do with the people who are getting together and praying for this church on Thursdays or the teams that pray on Sunday morning for an hour before our service, pleading with heaven for God to move, for hearts to be captured, for people to be healed, set free, and deliver. If you pray for this church, can I just say thank you in Jesus' name? Your prayers are working. They're effective for what God wants to do through through his church and in, and in your life. Because I still believe that God changes everything. And Jesus changes everything when people come and when people pray. Even in a world, even in a city, where it might seem like everybody's walking away from God, God can still change the weather. It's interesting. It's how James pens the last verses of his letter. He says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And thus ends the book of James. When a person walks away, when a generation walks away, when a world is walking away, pray him back. Start praying. It's amazing, the Bible, through all the generations, God's timeless word says, hey, if anybody's reading this in 2024, and you maybe find yourself in a world where people are quitting their faith, and they're giving up on God, can I just tell you to pray? Can I just tell you that the reins of revival can come back to a generation, can come to a city, can come to a church? Because our God changes the weather. Because the prayers of the righteous and the effective one are Jesus. 
And when he's alive and active in you, his prayers always get answered. His spirit is always interceding for us. Jesus is always interceding at the right hand of the Father, wanting to reach, wanting to save, wanting the reins of revival to fall. So why not us? Why not now? I close with this. New York City, Manhattan, 1857, a man named Jeremiah Lamphere looked at the awful condition of the people in his city and he was moved to pray. Seeing what happened in the second great awakening, he was stirred to put advertisements all over the churches, all over the streets, come and pray. Come and cry out to God for rain. And six people showed up. Six out of a million. But he knew that strong storms, they start from small clouds. The next week, 14 people showed up. The next week, 26 people showed up. By the end of that year, his entire church was packed, praying and pleading with the Lord for rain, for healing, for deliverance, to turn a city back. By the next year, every church was packed. At the end of two years, two million people were saved. They estimate 10,000 people a week were saved, set free, healed, delivered, and baptized. All because one ordinary person still believed that God could change the weather when we pray. The question is, why not us? Miracle City, why not now?